Thank you uh, very much and good afternoon, everyone. How is Smart Cities New York so far? That wasn't that enthusiastic. How about something a bit more enthusiastic? Yeah! Okay, that was mostly me, but I'll take that as an enthusiastic A minus. So we have a terrific panel here uh, this afternoon, and I'll introduce the panelists in a moment. Um, I just wanted to set the, the context uh, a little bit from the perspective of the panel, and we had a discussion uh, last week about this. I think we're all agreed on the, the context. Um, climate change is one of the most significant challenges of our times. And from the perspective of the C40 Climate Leadership Group, which is a group of nearly 100 of the world's leading cities organized through collaboration mayor to mayor, our perspective is that that battle is going to be won or lost in cities. Uh, somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions of the world can be attributed uh, to the activities that happen in cities or that are necessary to sustain them, like generating electricity. And we know the sectors where those emissions mostly are. They're in transportation, uh, they're in energy generation, they're in waste management, and they're in how we heat and cool our buildings. So if we're able to find innovations in those areas, in transportation, in buildings, in waste management, in energy generation, and the most significant of those in certainly in North America and Europe are buildings, transportation, and energy generation. If we can find low carbon innovations that make those cities better places to live and make them better for people, we can address climate change. And that's certainly the model of, of the C40. Our cities have about a population of about 650 million, and the mayors involved are taking significant actions in those areas. And I wanted to give that a little bit of background because the panelists today have a remarkably diverse and I think really fascinating and complementary group of skills understood through the lens of climate change and what needs to be done. And by the way, that group over there seems to be a lot more enthusiastic, so you're gonna have to up your game. So that, that's the context. We're gonna get each of the panelists to talk for a few minutes, five to seven minutes, and then we'll have a a discussion um, uh, after that. We've got 45 minutes, after you, as you know. So the first question, oh, and I should introduce the panelists. That would be uh, polite and appropriate. Uh, to my left is uh, Pat Sapinsley, who's the Managing Director of Clean Tech Initiatives from the Urban Future Lab, uh, which is part of a, a series of incubators uh, at uh, NYU Tandon. Uh, really interesting. Uh, background and incredible enthusiasm for helping young people um, not just find innovations but make them innovations that are useful to society through commercializing and we'll, we'll hear from Pat in a moment. Next to Pat is Keith Kerman who's the Deputy Commissioner Department of Citywide Administrative Services and Chief Fleet Officer City of New York um, and I think Keith's intervention will be very interesting because traditionally chief fleet officers were not thought of as innovators. They had to deliver a service to departments, which was vehicles, at the lowest possible cost and keep them running. And uh, New York, as you'll hear, has been extremely uh, innovative on, on that front. Next to Keith is Stefano Boeri, who's the founding partner, Studio Stefano Boeri Architetti uh, from Milan, Italy. Uh, and those of you who know uh, that studio's work, it's amazing, uh, very environmentally conscious and famed for what Stefano calls a vertical forest. Much, much more to Stefano's work than that, uh, but you'll hear from him in a few minutes. Uh, and to his left is Rohan Patel, who's the Director of Policy and Business Development uh, from Tesla and brought a Tesla here, right Rohan? Yes, that's right. Uh, which, of course, everyone here who's happy and enthusiastic is allowed to drive. Um, so, uh, in that context, that's our panel, that's the background. So I'm going to pose the first question to, to Pat. In that context of climate and transportation, energy, and buildings, are you seeing emerging innovations that can make an impact? And if so, can you talk a little bit about them? Now 
can you hear me? Okay, that's funny. All right, um, so yes, I run the Urban Future Lab at Tandon School of Engineering. We run three programs there. I'm gonna talk primarily about the program where we scale up really innovative market-ready companies to meet the climate challenge. We have lots of people who understand the research and know that there's a problem out there. We have fewer people who are offering solutions. We specialize in, those, in scaling up those solutions to meet the challenge. And there is no silver bullet. Our companies work in smart grid, smart buildings, smart transportation. Anything we can do that's a market-ready solution that will take GHG out of the air and help young entrepreneurs to scale up businesses, that's the kind of business we want to work with. Um, just to give you an example of what some of these are, in the grid space, we're, we bring in companies from overseas to work on the REV initiative. You know, policy often can drive change. So the policy in New York State called Reforming the Energy Vision is causing us to bring companies in from overseas to try to work on the grid. We have Smarter Grid Solutions from Scotland. They're working to incorporate distributed energy resources onto the grid. We have Opus One Solutions from Toronto. You might know of them. Yay. <laughs> We brought them in also to bring distributed energy resources onto the grid. Um, these are really exciting companies who are, I think, uh, the statistic might be that 40% of the REV demonstration projects exist in our incubators. These are very young companies with market-ready solutions who are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with ABB and Siemens and winning the bids. So it's extremely exciting. Uh, in smart buildings, we have uh, companies like Simuat, that's an interesting new auditing tool that can regularize data that's coming in in many different forms and do very smart, very simple energy models that make the process quicker, better, faster. Um, we have Fentrend, which is like an Expedia for specifying energy efficient windows. I'm an architect by training. Instead of having to look for weeks at the window companies that we know that might provide uh, argon filled triple pane glass, it might be a hopper, an awning. You can just type all those things into a screen and up will pop the five manufacturers who make that window, what their prices are, what the lead times are. It's going to disrupt the entire construction industry. This is software in the service of climate change. Um, we also have uh, transportation technologies. We have two companies doing EV charging, one doing wireless EV charging called Hevo. We have a company doing rides in dollar ride vans for people in underserved transportation deserts because they need public transportation too. So these are all companies that we help by introducing them to uh, uh, channel to market partners so that they can go forward in the market. We help them to find sources of funding with venture capital or with grants. We help them find customers. It's very exciting to help young people and get lots of the grid every day. So thank you. That's a, a great and succinct uh, summary of some really interesting um, new technologies and, and new software. And I, I think we'll get a bit further along, Pat. It would be interesting to hear a bit more about how, what the real obstacles are and, and how to overcome them for those small companies. Uh, Keith, if I could turn to you next. Um, you've got a role that traditionally was a service provider to departments. Um, you're there as a civil servant. All of a sudden, you notice that the mayor's just made an announcement that the mayor is committing to significant climate change goals that involve dramatically reducing emissions from transportation. I guess two questions. First of all, what do you do? And is it even real? You know, can cities actually make those commitments? Is it possible from your perspective as manager of thousands of vehicles uh, to serve the departments and to meet the climate aggressive climate goals that uh, the city of New York, in your case, has set. Okay, thank you, David. Um, thank you all for being in New York. I, I do work for the city of New York and live in the city of New York, so I always have to start with a welcome and a greeting. Um, so, the city fleet, and David's right, most fleets are, are internal service providers. Most people don't know their fleet managers or their fleet operators, though they should. You spend a lot of money with your fleets and a huge amount of what takes place in the public and private sectors depend on fleet operations. New York City is a little different. We are the largest municipal fleet in the United States with over 31,000 vehicles. 
We are a $1 billion a year operation with 2,000 full-time people, 80,000 operators, and I can guarantee you, you cannot walk 20 feet in the city of New York without walking by or listening to one of our fleet vehicles. We are the police department vehicles, the fire department, the sanitation department, um, and we are operating in and serv serving every part of this city every minute of the day. So absolutely, and as a sustainable challenge, so Mayor de Blasio, um, as David mentioned, challenged us with one of those 50 by 25 goals and 80 by 35 goals. Eliminate half of all fossil fuel use in the city fleet while maintaining all of our daily practical services, um, which every New Yorker depends on, and do it by 2025, and I'm a career civil servant, 2025 is seven years away. You're already three years in our current buying cycle. It's really not far away at all. Um, and we're a practical organization, so we have to figure out how to achieve that goal, and we're goal-driven, so we're going to achieve it, but we can't interrupt daily servicing, daily operations of these major agencies. So the question is, how do you do it? What we found, and we can talk more as we go along, that we're pretty sure we can do it. So New York City has implemented hybrid electric vehicles, 7,000 of them so far. When we first purchased them, they were more expensive, a little bit more difficult than other vehicles. They are now less expensive and frankly, easier to maintain and operate than other vehicles. We are one of the largest biodiesel users in the United States. Every single city truck uses a four, either five to 20% biofuel, um, including our emergency services. We have had no operational issues, frankly, at all, and we spend less on diesel since we've implemented biofuel, not more. Our city ambulances, one of the major issues, if you follow ambulances, are that they idle. An ambulance has to be ready to operate at all times, so they never turn off. That uses a lot of fuel, causes a lot of noise, it's actually not that pleasant to, to live near, um, but incredibly essential. We are now operating our ambulances, half of them, 300 of our 600, soon all of them, with anti-idling alternative power batteries so that when you are idling, waiting for a call, the engine's turned off, the battery's turned on, you've eliminated the emissions and frankly an enormous amount of maintenance headache, but you still can do your role. Um, we just announced a project last week involving something called renewable diesel, which may be a next stage of biofuels that allows us to replace all diesel fuel something that San Francisco, and we got it, and have been partnering the city of San Francisco on this, has already done, that we see as viable. So what's interesting, in a fleet that's enormously large, the 160 types of vehicles, 400 makes, 80,000 operators, um, that we actually believe that the technology is there, that the ways to do it are there, and, and we've tried to act as an aggressive adopter um, but we think we are on pace to achieve 50 by 2025, 20, possibly even ahead of time, and do it while city operations continue to function better um, than they have before. It's a uh, really compelling story, and I'm sure we'll dig into that a little bit uh, later, and perhaps with some insights on, on where the private sector can go as well, Keith. Um, thanks very much for that uh, initial intervention. Stefano. Um, thought I would ask you about what's the role of buildings in creating a green city of the future, and you can interpret green however you wish. Thanks. Well, um, if we could concentrate all the city of the world in one surface, we would not cover more than the 3% of the emerging land. But this 3%, as David was saying, it's a uh, it's, uh, consuming the 75% of the world's natural resources and account for more than 7% of global CO2 emissions. So that means that uh, in a certain way, say that cities are largely responsible for climate change, uh, and at the same time they are the first victims of climate change because 90% of urban environment are coastal 
environment. So the risk of flooding connected with the rising of the ocean is uh, uh, well, very, very serious. What we should do, what we sh could do as architects, urban planners, is to try to find a way to make cities protagonists of the solution, of the problem that they have, they only they created and they are suffering with this. Uh, I think we need a, a holistic approach to climate change. Uh, but we cannot avoid to consider that uh, forests and woodlands are absorbing the 35-40% of that CO2 produced by cities. So instead of destroying forest or grazing woodland, we should probably do our best to increase the green surfaces, implement the number of trees of forests and woodlands in our urban environment. So my answer is yes, we can do something. In the last 10, 15 years, as architect, we have done a lot in terms of uh, transforming our building in a plant capable to absorb the renewable energies, the energy from the sun, the energy from the wind, using geothermal plant and so on. So we have done a lot in terms of technological innovation. Now it's uh, the moment to combine this first direction with the second direction, which is let's work in order to make our city not simply greener, but let's launch a campaign for the urban forestry. That means create new parks, create urban forest all around our cities, transform our roofs in uh, lawns and uh, vegetable gardens, use the empty voice of, uh, to change and transform uh, them using the roots of the plants as a way to clean the polluted soil and realize vertical forest where this is possible. So that is what we could do. Thanks. Thanks. Uh very much, Stefan. I'm sure there's going to be some additional discussion on uh, those issues. Uh, for example, are urban forests compatible with electric vehicles? I don't know. Uh, Rohan, uh, can you talk a bit? Um, uh, Teslas are very sexy. They're fast. They're beautiful. I think other electric vehicles have similar attributes. Are they part of the solution, or are they just a niche? And if we're going to make them part of the solution, what needs to be done? It's a, it's a great question, uh, Mr. Mayor. So I had, I had the privilege um, for eight years uh, during the Obama administration to be the president's liaison to cities. And my, my primary focus was climate and energy work. But I will say, I think organizations like C40, um, through those eight years, the difference that we saw between 2009 and 2016 in terms of the ambition level in terms of sophistication from cities, not just New York. Obviously, New York's doing some phenomenal things, but cities across the country. You saw, I, I hope you get a chance to meet Mayor Stodola from Little Rock, doing some really interesting things on climate. And, and Mayor Nutter used to say something to us, uh, Mayor Nutter of Philadelphia, former mayor of Philadelphia. And if, you are, if there are city practitioners in here, uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was an interesting way of looking at these conferences, which is, um, if you don't take one thing back to your city that you can implement, you have failed. So your, your job should not be networking with people. Your job should be finding something you can take back to your city and implement. And I think Philadelphia was benefited uh, by that kind of mindset. To your question, it's uh, frankly going to be obvious um, to everyone in any city uh, that folks will want to go electric. Um, the, the benefits from a performance standpoint uh, are multiple fold. The benefits from a safety aspect are also multiple fold. And that's not even saying anything about the climate benefits just from the tailpipe and, and in terms of the power sector. The coolest thing about an EV, any EV, not just ours, is that as time goes by, certainly in the US and in many other nations, most other nations, your car gets cleaner. It does not stay the same. Your car gets cleaner. And so that's a, that's a major uh, mind shift. I think the one unique thing about Tesla is 
not only does your car get cleaner, but your car gets smarter with over-the-air updates. So one of the things that our customers love is that their car keeps getting better. There's new features, there's new stuff that they can play with, the performance of the car itself. So, so I think to your question, it's not going to be a niche uh, for very long. In fact, it'll be quite obvious um, in, in a very short amount of time. I think that the thing, though, that is, is really worth digging into and uh, for cities to dig into um, is twofold. One, of course, the infrastructure. Lots of folks are looking at EV infrastructure. Lots of innovative companies are looking at how to better that infrastructure. But cities, rather than thinking about you know, how much stuff can we deploy, really get down to the basics. What does the wiring look like? What does your building code look like? What is your partnership with your utility that can make that happen quickest, accelerate that uh, the most? And cities that are doing that um, deserve to, you know, I, I'm sure, Mr. Mayor, you, you had uh, experience with this, but in Vancouver, um, every single new building has to be outfitted EV ready, and that includes paneling, conduit lines, wiring. So you really have to dig in a little bit deeper than just to say, let's put some fast charging stations here, there, and elsewhere on, on roads. It, you you got to go a step deeper. And then the second thing is, it's not just electric vehicles for transportation, which in the United States is the largest uh, problem in terms of CO2 emissions. It's also the trucking fleet. And so that's part of the reason, part of what animated the economics work out even much better than an EV uh, light duty vehicle for the heavy duty sector. And so I think we'll see many more companies Cummins is one, uh, based in Indiana. Uh, Nikola, there's a, there's a number of companies, and Tesla certainly will be one of those, that will invest in that infrastructure. And there's a lot that cities could do, states need to do, the federal government needs to do, uh, to, to incent the advent of, uh, of electrification of the heavy duty sector as well. It's not where I expected Tesla to, to end up. That's a very interesting, and maybe I could just ask Keith, do you have any comments about the private sector, you're doing great leadership in the fleet in New York, very interesting, going greener and saving money at the same time. Are we seeing the same trends in the private sector? And if not, um, are there things that leadership can do to, to overcome that along the lines of what Roham was saying that, um, you know, the trucking sector is ripe for uh, uh, EVs? Well, thank you. First of all, I actually want to mention New York City uh, as a fleet does operate 1,500 electric vehicles, 500 electric vehicle chargers. Um, no Teslas at the moment, but we will accept your donation of that Tesla sitting outside. John um, will take the keys, or if there are no keys, we'll take whatever passcode you have. Um, that would be great. The private set, you know, in the, the fleet is an industry. And, and you know we understand that it's a large industry in the both public and private sides. Um, but it depends, and we depend as a public fleet, on private sector innovation. Um, I've often said that we do not develop or design um, fleet alternatives. Um, we do not produce our own energy. Until now, um, we just rolled out 37 solar independent freestanding carports. So we do now produce our own energy a little bit. Um, but fundamentally, we rely on the movement of this industry. Certainly, if you go back 12 years ago, they quite literally wrote a movie, said, who killed the electric car? Well, obviously, it was a premature death and a premature movie, but it was policy that helped move the marketplace to create the or rejuvenate the electric car industry. Obviously, Tesla, a huge part of that, but we've seen that across the board. Um, in 2001, the city of New York had one vehicle manufacturer and one type of alternative fuel vehicle. We now, 17 years later, have over 40 different makes and models in operation. So that is the marketplace bringing more to bear that we can then invest in you. So the private sector is a huge and important partner. We certainly embrace that. Um, on May 17th at Flushing Meadow Park, you can come to our annual um, public fleet show where 150 vendors come and promote and show off the latest and greatest in safe and sustainable technologies. That's at the Unisphere in, in Flushing Meadow Park, so I'll do a pitch. But, but we absolutely recognize that industry and industry development is critical 
But I will say, and it may pre preface a question that's coming, it really depends on market demand, right? Industry is trying to make a profit, I've been told. I, I took a civil service test, so that was not a question on it. But, um, <laughs> but ultimately, market demand matters. So in, in many ways, it's customers, private fleets, private citizens pushing the private sector and industry in this direction that's as critical as anything we can do. Well, th those comments give rise to a, a couple of questions that maybe I can just, uh, I guess, put out one at a time for the for the panel. But you know, Keith just, just mentioned the role of people, and that is one of the themes of this conference, powered by people. So, be interested in the panelists' thoughts, and please uh, uh, jump in. You know, what's the role of people in making this transition, in in helping ensure? that we start to live low carbon lifestyles in harmony with, with the planet, whether it's to do with buildings, transportation, innovation. What's the role of people? And it's a conference theme, so this is a compulsory question. You must answer. Stefano? Yeah, well, uh, uh, it's not easy to be, to be uh, superficial in answering to this issue. I think uh, there is a, a survey by the World Economic Forum who say that 49% of the millennials are considering climate change the, the main concern for the future. Uh, so I, I could answer uh, in saying that schools, mainly public schools, could play a crucial role in the future. So my point is not simply, well, let's try to uh, enlarge more we can the number of people that are involved in large campaign for sustainability, for living with climate change and so on. That's, that's for sure what we have to do and we try to do every day. But I think that schools, schools are uh, the place where we should invest for our energies. Uh, I'll give you an example. We have just finished to design the, the master plan for uh, for the capital of Albania, which is a small country in, in Europe. And we have designed the, the idea of a, of a new city with, uh, for sure, a lot of forest and environment and so on. But we have also designed the 22 new public schools, open at 24 hours a day, all the day of the year for all the ages. And what we want to do, and the, the Prime Minister of Albania is working with us on that, is to make this school the epicenters of uh, new awareness about climate change. Maybe I can, I think there's, there's two parts to the theme of the conference. One is really focused, for me at least, on the, how we can build inclusion and equity into these solutions. Uh, another part though, in terms of people empowerment, is frankly making things easier and cooler. Uh, so I'll just give you one example, both in terms of our battery, uh, the power walls, your residential battery, and in terms of the car, we now have, uh, and we've had this technology for some time, the ability for customers to say, we want to charge at a certain time, we want to charge based on the lowest carbon output, we want to charge based on the lowest cost output, and make it just one click, easy, Fun, cool. We had a utility, uh, a, a, somebody that worked at the, a local utility in, in uh, Michigan, and her and her husband now compete with each other about who is actually charging at the best time and how much their electric vehicle is. is there's, there's a lot of things that technology can do to make things easier for consumers. I think in terms of people's interaction with climate solutions, we have to be honest with ourselves about how much time and effort people can really put into those types of activities and make it that much simpler for people to make the right decision, make it obvious to make that right decision, make it cheaper to make the right decision, and that involves government for sure, whether that's uh, basic, direct uh, you know, incentive structures, uh, cap and trade systems like you have in, in Ontario, and, and the like. So yeah, we have to send price signals, we have to make things cooler in the private sector. And to your forest question, um, 
we, uh, we had a customer randomly who said, um, you know, why aren't state parks in California, why aren't they outfitted with supercharging infrastructure? We go there all the time and we've got Teslas. So now we have a partnership with a number of state parks and hopefully soon the national park system, if the Department of Interior will, uh, will listen to us, and we're, we're outfitting them with, uh, with superchargers. So, you know, that's, those are the kinds of things, listen to your customers and make things easier. So, uh, to your point, you mentioned making energy choices cooler and easier and more accessible. Well, until now, our local utilities have been calling their customers ratepayers. Until now, the people who are buying energy, the consumers, you, have engaged with their energy choices six minutes a year. There were no choices to make. Accenture did a study, six minutes a year, nobody cares. We need to make people care. And one, one way that we can make people care is by introducing some equity into the system. Right now, if you're impoverished and you're not well educated, all you're gonna care about is that your bill is high, but you're not gonna have the tools you need to make the decisions that you could make to bring those costs down. So we absolutely need to educate the public. We have to stop treating them as ratepayers and start treating them as customers and have interesting, fun choices for them to make, like you were saying. And the other thing we have to do is level the playing field and have things like community solar that makes solar accessible, not just to wealthy people who own their own roofs, but to people in apartment buildings in city, in public housing in the city, who can now, through companies like one of ours at the incubator, called the power market, look it up online, uh, you can buy your power now in New York City from a solar installation in Queens or in the Bronx. You can sign up and it would be seamless for you to do it. You would never notice a difference, except suddenly you're getting clean power and by the way, it'll be cheaper than the power you've been getting from your utility. So there are ways to engage people that make them want to participate. We just have to think of those things. In the transportation sector, we have a company called Dollar Ride. Uh, I mentioned that they are serving people in transportation deserts, even in a city like New York, where we think we have the greatest transportation system on earth, we might have. We have deserts out by Canarsie. You have to take two buses to get to a train, and that encourages people to drive their own cars. We don't want people driving their own cars into the city. So dollar rides have evolved, these vans that go around and pick people up. Now if we can give the, the dollar, sorry, uh, what are they called? Commuter vans, ours is called dollar ride. Um, if we can give the commuter van operators tools such as data that will help them optimize their routes, allow people to pay for them on a cell phone so the, the person driving the van doesn't live in fear of being robbed, then we've brought a service to those underserved areas that everybody else takes for granted. And we're making that service smarter, it serves people better, it's easier for the provider and for the user. So in the answering that people power question, the theme of equity and inclusion came out in a couple of places. I'd like to just hear a bit more from the panel because Sometimes people hear smart cities and they think it's all about this and, you know, young, smart millennials with, with uh, a great career ahead of them when it should be inclusive of everyone. We've heard a, a couple of pieces of what might be in, an inclusive way to approach it. Any further thoughts, anybody on the panel? How, how do we ensure that a smart city is a city that's actually welcoming and equitable? and inclusive. I can, you know, I think uh, it's, you're a pretty stupid city if you're not uh, looking out for the least uh, amongst you. And, and, and so, you know, I think one of the most important things in the transport sector is uh, the impact of, uh, uh, the impact of pollution on the, the least amongst us and those communities that are most impacted my daughter happens to be one. My wife is a pulmonologist, of all things, and uh, her study is actually in uh, how environmental uh, impacts affect COPD and lung disease. W one, one really important thing that we can do, and governments must do, certainly the federal government in, in the US, um, is really fund environmental education at that level. Make, make it easy 
uh, for people to understand what's in their actual backyard. You know, you talk about people empowerment. People get excited when they find out, or they get really pissed off when they find out that there's a super fun site next door, or they find out that those trucks that are at the port are spewing out nitrous oxide that's, you know, harming their babies. Um, they, they, they get upset and they look for ways to organize and mobilize and make things happen. So there's, there's both a public policy angle to this that's really important. There's a, uh, and, and that includes charging infrastructure and, and all the like. But there's also an educational aspect for cities to open up their data streams, for cities to open up some of the underbelly of what exists in their cities, um, whether that's landfill use or uh, Superfund sites or, or the like, and make that available for entrepreneurs that are out there to come and say, look what's happening here, here's, what, here's how you can do something about it. And so that level of community engagement is starting to happen and it's really cool to see it when it does. Okay. So certainly we've been talking about sustainability in terms of greenhouse gases, but most of us started on this on air quality issues. And in New York City, um, air quality um, impacts certain communities much more than others, um, but impacts all of us. So my son as well, my son's homesick today because um, he's having asthma issues. And you know, you wake up as a New Yorker and you realize, you know, and I probably didn't think of this until I had children, I live smack in between two four-lane highways that are really only 100 feet away on either side. Isn't it shocking that you know, our children have breathing problems? Um, and so these issues are not just kind of the global climate change issues, but are day-to-day -day issues that all of us as New Yorkers face, it's the air that you breathe, and it's absolutely an, equi an equity issue. There are clearly parts of the city that are impacted by traffic and by trucking much more than others. Certainly on what we try and do on, for, for the city fleet is improve the emissions across all our vehicles, especially on the trucking side, the sanitation trucks, the ambulances um, that have the biggest impact. So picking up on that point and resonating with some of the other comments that have come from the panel, there have been several points where people have spoken about uh, issues that I would call leadership. We, we need to see some leadership to pull some of these themes together. Stefano, you talked about the schools, for example, the importance of education. Where do we need to see that leadership coming from? Is it from innovators? Is it from people themselves? You know, citizens saying we need to see these changes. Is it from elected officials? You know, is it from creative people? And you know, Stefano, I wonder if you have some thoughts on on, on that. Well, I, I, is it from event like this one? I, I, I think that this uh, capacity to network to the networks to create a platform where it's possible to share the best practices and let me to, add it, to share the mistakes, the failures, which is probably more important than to share the successful. It's extremely important and we miss that one at this point. We, so uh, I'm very happy to be here because this is probably one of the moments in my recent experience where I find the opportunity to you know, compare different attitudes and approach. So I think some of this can be done with policy and some of this has to be done with markets. Uh, and the combination of the two is a very interesting combination. You know, in, in China, you can tell your population how many children to have. You can also tell them exactly how, what their maximum KW usage should be. In America, we do that by simply billing more for higher KW usage. We try to let the market take over. We also certainly have policies such as building department rules and regulations, and we're starting to push on those things now. We're starting to incorporate stretch codes, which every year get more and more stringent, trying to get towards a goal. Also, so, so that those are ways, some of those are ways that markets will move us, some of those are ways that policy will move us. Uh, in the governor's office in New York, when they started this reforming the energy vision thing, the idea was that we have seen that the grid is over 100 years old. It's going to be very, very difficult to transform it. One way to transform it might be to let little pieces of 
market design, change the grid, and experiment not with, not with things like reliability, safety, none of that, but with business model innovation that can show us a new way to work with transportation, distribution, and generation. For instance, if you look at the net metering laws in other states, they're mostly being solved now in the courts. Net metering, I'm sure all of you know, is a way of getting distributed energy resources onto the grid and trying to figure out how to compensate uh, the, the person who's got the solar panel, who's generating power, and the utility who's carrying that power on their wires. How are we going to figure this out? Is it at a retail price? Is it a wholesale price? Everybody's suing everyone. It's a mess. In New York, we're trying very hard to get the utilities to sit down with people in the market and have them together design a methodology that works, that can determine, yes, the value of energy at a certain place on the grid where there's constriction at a certain moment in time might be different from the value of that power at a different time on the same place in the grid. So we're looking at those kinds of solutions and letting people try to experiment and come up with solutions that work. We're looking at non-wires alternatives. Instead of building new infrastructure, new transmission infrastructure, we're trying to figure out if there are ways to simply incorporate and compensate energy efficiency so that there won't be so much stress on the grid and you don't have to build that new transmission. These are sort of market-driven ideas that we're working on, we're testing new business models, and we're inching forward. It's a very slow process. But that's democracy, that's what happens, and this is a very good model. So, very interesting answer, and it's a good lead in. We've just got a couple minutes left. I'll just ask each of uh, uh, the panelists, starting with Rohan, do you have any final thoughts? For example, what's the single most important thing that needs to be done today, whether it's through government leadership, private sector leadership, or from people, in order to live a low carbon future? Well, I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I don't have a great answer for that. It's not a very good question if there isn't an answer. Well, there is. I'm sure there are folks answers. out here have great answers to it. What I, what I would want to say, and uh, this goes back to the first question that you asked about EVs, are they just a niche? And, and how that maybe builds off your, your last question, which is for the lithium-ion battery, and really batteries for all the things we've talked about, um, whether it's generation or transportation, batteries are the holy grail, right? Um, I think everybody basically understands that storage and battery technology is, is the holy grail. The most cool thing about the lithium ion is that the payoff in terms of recycling the lithium ion batteries is incredibly fast, and you can reuse 99% of what's in the, the lithium ion battery. So we, in very short order, um, we don't have lots of old Teslas coming, uh, coming back in terms of recycling. But what happens now in terms of e-waste, most of the e-waste that you guys made, hopefully you're recycling your electronic materials, it gets thrown into a slurry and reused for completely different things. What you're going to see from lithium ion, and, and we've already seen this in China policies to this end, all, a complete reuse of the battery. And, and the economic payoff, because virgin mining of, of these materials is so expensive, the economic payoff is almost immediate. So we're already building a recycling factory in, in Nevada. We'll have a couple more throughout the United States. And I think that's one of those game-changing issues, both that needs a government policy, but also needs private sector innovation um, to advance uh, what I think is really the holy grail of both the transport sector and the generation sector. Very quickly, uh, Stefano and Keith have final thoughts. If there's one thing you see as necessary or any other final thoughts based on the conversation of the panel. Yes, thanks, Noah. Well, for sure one is uh, urban forestry, uh, FAO, uh, so the Food and Agriculture Organization is organizing in Mantova, Italy, in November, the first international forum of urban forestry. That will be part of that. So uh, I think this is uh, one of the 
important answer. But I go back to the idea of schools. I think that we should all ask COP24 to ask the countries all over the world to introduce climate change as one of the main counter in the school programs all over the world. So I think that, for instance, for C40, that could be an amazing struggle. Thanks. Terrific. And Keith, Keith last words uh, to you. Sure. So first, answering your question, do trees and electric cars go together? I started my career in the Parks Department, where we were focused on planting trees. Now I'm doing electric cars. They go together perfectly. In fact, it's, it's a natural marriage. I want to say something just about technology. We've seen in the last 10 years that companies like Tesla and others can bring fuel-efficient, carbon-efficient technologies to market. Yet the reality, including announcements made just in the last few weeks, are that more Americans right now are trading in their sedans to get larger SUVs, doubling emissions, than doing the opposite. So I, I think the single most important thing is bridging the gap of interest and commitment and understanding of these issues. Ultimately, you know, all of us, and, and that means all of, all of our fellow citizens, need to be moving in a generally similar direction for us to get where we're going. I think technology has shown that they can achieve their side, but we need to have the will and the interest and the demand to get there. Uh, great answers. Uh, mine would have been elect the right people, but that's probably for a different discussion on another day. Uh, can we just give some acknowledgement to our terrific panel, Rohan Patel, Stefano Bayeri, Keith Kermit, and Pat Sipinsley for their excellent presentations today. And thank all of you for being part of Smart Cities uh, NYC this year.